I'm Soham Das, and you're watching the Exploring Central Asia talk series presented by the Tirutuma Foundation. Over the years, the Central Asian region has been a crucial focus area for us at the Tirutuma Foundation. The Central Asia talk series is in line of our several major academic and track to diplomatic initiatives related to the region with the participation of leading diplomats, experts, organizations, and institutions. In this talk series, we have some of the leading experts on Central Asia from across the world talk about diverse aspects about this vibrant and fascinating region. Today at the seventh and final talk of this season of the Exploring Central Asia talk series, our distinguished speaker is renowned expert on Sino-Russian relations, Professor Elizabeth Wishnik. Professor Elizabeth Wishnik is a senior research scientist in the China and Indo-Pacific Security Affairs Division at the Center for Naval Analysis of the US Navy and Marine Corps and a senior research scholar at Columbia University's Weatherhead East Asian Institute. Apart from her works on Sino-Russian relations in Eurasia, she also has various publications on Central Asia. She is currently on leave from her position as professor of political science and law at the Montclair State University. She is the author of the books like uh, Mending Fences, The Evolution of Moscow's China Policy from Brezhnev to Yeltsin, and China's interests and goals in the Arctic implications for the United States. It is a great pleasure, Professor Vishnik, to have you here among us once again at the Tirutuma Foundation to deliver this talk. Let me especially thank Kamakshi Watson, Chief Operating Officer and Director of Academic Programs, Tirutuma Foundation, for her leadership, dedication, and sincere efforts. Professor Vishnik will be talking today on the theme of Sino-Russian partnership and the roles of China and Russia in Central Asia. Since the visit of uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping to Moscow, there has been a lot of discussion on the strategic partnership between uh, the People's Republic of China and the Russian Federation and its uh, probable uh, global uh, geopolitical impact. The close personal relationship between President Putin and President Xi has also been analyzed. This is especially crucial in the context of uh, the ongoing Ukraine-Russia war, as well as uh, the tensions between the United States and China. Central Asia is an interesting region where uh, some manifestation of this partnership may be visible in the near future. Of course, both Russia and China are members of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, uh, where uh, the four Central Asian states of Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and Kyrgyzstan are also present. India and Pakistan are also members of this uh, organization. Iran has also been uh, included as a member. Recently, we have heard Saudi Arabia has been made a dialogue partner of this uh, organization. Uh, so in fact, the uh, presidents of China and Russia recently met at the SEO summit in Samarkand, Uzbekistan in September, 2022, uh, their first meeting since the outbreak of the Ukraine-Russia war. We will discuss these issues as well as uh, the individual roles of China and Russia in Central Asia over the years. Uh, we look forward to hearing from Elizabeth Wishnik. Uh, over to you, Professor Wishnik. Uh, thank you uh, so much uh, for this uh, kind introduction. I'm, I'm so pleased to have the opportunity to speak with you about this topic. Um, in the US, there's a lot of interest now in how India fits into the China-Russia partnership. Uh, so I'm very interested uh, to hear your thoughts uh, as well about this important relationship and how uh, India might uh, play a role in this region. Um, I did have the opportunity to hear some earlier presentations uh, to your foundation and found them very illuminating. Uh, and so uh, I'm very happy to contribute further to this dialogue. Uh, so today, uh, what I'm going to talk about uh, first is uh, the Sino-Russian partnership. Uh, this, this talk is well-timed, uh, as you just heard, uh, she and Putin just met in uh, Moscow. And uh, so we have a sense of where their partnership is going. And uh, so then I will talk a bit about what this partnership might mean for Central Asia. And I'll particularly uh, focus on Kazakhstan uh, because I recently spent a month there as a part of a Fulbright uh, Global Award and was talking to experts there about China's relations uh, with Kazakhstan as a part of a book project. Um, I'm, nearing uh, completion uh, called China's Risk, uh, Energy, Water, Food, and Regional Security, where I look at China's uh, resource relations 
with uh, Russia, Kazakhstan, and Mongolia. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen and uh, have a PowerPoint uh, to um, guide us along. Okay, so I am a senior research scientist at CNA. CNA is a nonprofit uh, organization, and we do work with the U.S. Navy and Marines, uh, but, but these are my personal views uh, as an academic, and they don't represent any um, organization. Okay. Uh, so what are the drivers of the Sino-Russian partnership? Um, uh, so this is a, this map um, gives us a little bit of a clue. Uh, for one thing, uh, uh, the uh, ge geography uh, is an important context uh, for this partner partnership. If you look at, even at this uh, brief map, you see that Russia is larger than China. In fact, it's nearly 80% larger than China. Um, China is about the same size as the United States, um, but China has has uh, about uh, nearly ten times the population of Russia. Um, so you have some un, you know unequal disposition uh, geographically. They share a very lengthy border, uh, um, over four thousand kilometers, uh, forty two oh nine, and which is about uh, twenty six hundred miles. And uh, this border has not always been peaceful, as you know. Uh, in 1969, they fought br a brief border war. Um, and um, as a result, they militarized their border for the next uh, 20 years, which uh, deprived both countries of development in their border regions. Um, and uh, also cost them a lot of money in terms of um, fortifying this border. And so one of the imperatives of the partnership today is to make sure that they have a peaceful border um, and that they can use uh, their revenue to develop their border regions and not to fortify them. And also, uh, China also often talks about the importance of Russia as a strategic rear uh, meaning that uh, China, as it faces uh, increasing competition with the United States, doesn't have to worry about um, its uh, border with Russia, that that border uh, presumably would be stable. Um, so that the border is an important, uh, having a, a stable and secure border is very important. And then resources. And so I mentioned that the two countries have differences in terms of their size and their population. One area, uh, another area where they have um, uh, complementarity is in, in resources. So 70% of the imports that China gets from Russia consist of resources, uh, mostly energy resources. Um, and this is quite important uh, for China, is China tends to, to see land-based sources of energy as more secure than sea-based because the sea lanes would be subject uh, to potential interference by the United States and its allies. Um, so if you look at oil, for example, uh, Russia um, has been among the top three suppliers of oil, oil uh, to China. Um, this past year, it was supplying about 20% of China's oil, and China imports a more than 70% of its oil. So that's quite an important um, import for China. Um, and oil is about 20% um, of China's energy mix. Um, so uh, supplies of oil through the East Siberian pipeline um, have been important uh, for China. Gas, China uses uh, less gas than oil. About It's about 8% of China's energy mix, but Russia accounts for about 10% of that. And so you have the power of Siberia gas pipeline and also liquid natural gas, LNG, uh, from uh, the Russian Far East and from 
the Arctic going to, to China. And coal. So coal is still very important for China's energy mix, still about half of China's energy mix, and Russia accounts for uh, about 18% of China's coal. Uh, so Russia is the second largest coal supplier in, in the world. Um, and so these energy ties are, are, are quite significant for China because of its concern for its energy security. Um, so uh, if we look at the other aspects of, of uh, the Russia-China uh, economic relationship, I mean, there have been some obstacles uh, to uh, boosting the trade volume in the last year uh, since the Russian invasion of Ukraine, we've seen a 34% increase in trade uh, with bilateral trade reaching 190 billion. So that sounds like a lot, uh, but actually that's a bit less than China's trade with Malaysia, which is considerably smaller country. So the potential for trade has not really been reached because of the um, in the Russian view, they're dissatisfied. They've always been dissatisfied that most of the trade has been in resources rather than in manufactured goods. Uh, but uh, China has sought, um, you know, technologies from other countries rather than Russia. Also, uh, trade trade with Russia only represents about three percent of China's trade. Uh, so, is so the overall trade relationship is not that important for China but it's quite important for Russia, as China has been Russia's top trade partner for some time. Uh, so uh, trade might not be one of the key drivers of, relationship, of the relationship, though, uh, though the resource piece is quite significant. Um, but then uh, I think we have to keep in mind that it's not only about the material aspects of the partnership, we also have to look at the normative uh, drivers, um, particularly how they view uh, the, the global order and their place in it. Both countries uh, stand together in opposition to, uh, to uh, the U.S. alliance system. They feel pressure from the United States for various reasons, and they see themselves as major powers that are trying to regain what they consider their rightful role in international affairs. So they have some slight differences in terms of how they view the global order, with Russia preferring a multipolar order, and China uh, seeing itself as a leader of a new community of common destiny. But they do share certain values, nonetheless, in terms of uh, non-interference, in the affairs of authoritarian states, uh, their views about information sovereignty, their right to control uh, their own information space and restrict the flow of information that they consider harmful to their political systems. And they uh, believe in mutual respect for their own territorial integrity and sovereignty, uh, not necessarily that of other countries. Um, as well as their opposition to sanctions. So these are, and I'm going to talk separately about military cooperation, which is an important piece as well. Let's see. Uh, so here we see uh, in the, I hope you can see this photo, uh, Xi Jinping and Putin um, meeting in Moscow, and these are some state, some of their comments from the most recent summit. They've met uh, now 40 times. And so one interesting moment at the summit is that they didn't use the, the language no limits uh, to the partnership, which we saw in the February 4th, 2022 agreement that they signed just before Russia invaded Ukraine. Um, here we see Xi talking about how China-Russia ties have gone far beyond bilateral relationship, bilateral relations that are of vital importance. And Putin talks about the relationship reaching its highest level and being secure, superior in quality to Cold War uh, partnerships. 
Um, and we see that statement superior in quality also in the text of the agreement that they signed at this summit. Um, and I, I think that was because there was a, uh, the international community fixated on this no limits comment and I think misunderstood the point of that. Um, that that name came from the Chinese foreign ministry and they were trying to explain that an alliance was not needed because uh, uh, because the uh, Sino-Russian partnership had uh, incredible potential. They didn't mean to say that there were no parameters. Uh, uh, something just happened to my screen here. <laughs> that there are no parameters to this partnership. Um, so we can talk more about uh, the uh, what happened in this partnership and what it means uh, for for Central Asia um, in a few moments. Um, another aspect of this partnership that everyone is speculating about has to do with um, military cooperation. Uh, so uh, what is the trajectory of their military cooperation? So uh, about two years ago, China and Russia signed a, a second five-year agreement uh, providing for uh, an outline of how they would pursue this military cooperation, including joint patrols and exercises, which they've been holding regularly since 2005. Some have been bilateral, and some have been uh, multilateral. And uh, we have seen uh, most recently in November 2022, a joint air patrols where for the first time, Russian and Chinese planes landed at each other's bases. Uh, the frequency of exercises has somewhat lessened in recent years that could be due to COVID. So we will have to see how, how the frequency um, uh, moves in, in the years to come. Uh, political military cooperation has been expanding. We see regular security dialogues, including about uh, Northeast Asia. Uh, we've seen more um, discussion of common positions on various aspects of arms control, uh, statements about um, uh, political military cooperation in their joint agreements. Um, and so that's been an area where we have seen deepening in recent years. Um, and of course, uh, China has been a major pur purchaser of Russian military equipment, the second largest for Russia after India, and received some equipment that would be quite significant in the Indo-Pacific, like the Su-35 planes and the S-400 um, missiles uh, defense systems. And they have been uh, talking about further technology cooperation, including in space, uh, AI, um, and uh, missile defense. And so this might be complicated somewhat by the sanctions that Russia faces at the moment and China's um, efforts to avoid counter sanctions. So we're going to have to see going forward how how that proceeds. Um, so in discussing this partnership, there tend to be two polar extremes to thinking about uh, the China-Russia partnership as an alliance, or on the other extreme saying that it's just a partnership of convenience, it really has no um, substantive content. And so my uh, position is, is in the middle. I would argue that it's a consequential partnership, but not a military alliance. Both countries claim that they uh, don't have an alliance. And in fact, Xi Jinping, in his statements at the recent summit, mentioned the three no's which have been in place in Chinese foreign policy since the Deng Xiaoping era, uh, no alliance um, being the key no in that in that uh, position. Uh, so I, I do think that the, that Putin and she try to give the impression of an alliance sometimes uh, to increase the deterrent value of their partnership, uh, much in the way that 
the U.S. Uh, policy of a strategic ambiguity on Taiwan is meant to increase the deterrent value of U.S. policy by uh, leaving open the possibility of, of a military response in a Taiwan scenario. I think we see the same thing in the China-Russia uh, partnership where they don't, they claim not to have an alliance, but they don't exclude it completely. And so I think that gives the partnership a greater deterrent value because we don't know um, in the event of a confrontation uh, with China, how Russia might act. Would it support China in some kind of military confrontation or not? Um, uh, that is a question. Uh, so these are the the main uh, contours of the Sino-Russian partnership, which I argue is one of consequence. It has certain material drivers, but also normative ones. Uh, what about the impact of Russia's war on Ukraine on this partnership? So we have seen some differences between the two countries. So China has been quite supportive of, of Russia rhetorically and at the United Nations, um, uh, echoing Russia's position that the US and its allies are to blame for this conflict. Uh, China has boosted trade with Russia um, uh, while trying to avoid counter sanctions um, and provided some dual use technologies. And we can talk more in the questions if you'd like about the issue of lethal aid. Uh, is China providing lethal aid to Russia? And there's some indications of some uh, that some dual use systems and some uh, aspects of military equipment have reached. Uh, Russia, uh, we've seen some airplane parts and and uh, some possibly some ammunition, but it's not clear that this is a uh, government Chinese government directed effort to provide military aid. Some Chinese companies have been sanctioned, but this is a, still at a very small scale. Uh, nonetheless. China has not recognized the annexation of Ukrainian territories, and uh, Chinese officials claim that they support territorial integrity and sovereignty of all countries, and that their bottom line is the UN Charter. Uh, but really, the bottom line seems to be nuclear use, because uh, the UN itself has, has stated that Russia violates the UN Charter, um, so that position does not seem very uh, credible, but China in its recent 12-point uh, plan for settlement of the conflict um, and in its uh, statements with Russia ha has come out against uh, nuclear threats and also targeting civilian nuclear power plants. Um, and so, and we saw just after the summit, after that statement was signed, barely the ink was barely dry, and then Russia began talking about putting tactical nuclear weapons in neighboring Belarus. Uh, so there are certainly some differences uh, between the two on Ukraine. And so that opens questions in many people's minds about how Russia and China will act in other places in the world. If they're not always on the same page on Ukraine, uh, what about Central Asia? So Central Asia is an area uh, where we have long assumed that China and Russia compete uh, for influence and that uh, they have had until now perhaps a, a an implicit division of labor where China provides the economic goods in terms of uh, trade and investment, while Russia provides the security for the region. And uh, we've, you know, we have seen China with its Belt and Road Initiative that's now in its 10th year, uh, invest in uh, infrastructure and uh, in resource industries and other industries in this region. And Russia, of course, is connected uh, to many of these states in the region through the 
Collective Security Treaty Organization, which China is not a member of. Um, and uh, Russia most recently intervened through the CSTO um, to, uh, in Kazakhstan in January of 2022. Uh, however, uh, we have seen uh, China becoming more active in security in the region, providing police training for some countries, using its own private security companies in the region, and putting border troops in Tajikistan due to concerns about potential spillover of threats from Af neighboring Afghanistan. Um, we have seen some instance of competition in the sense that the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, uh, which was a, a uh, an organization formed in on the basis of a confidence building initiative uh, uniting the Russia, China, and former Soviet uh, Central Asian states uh, to ensure border security. Uh, this became a China-led uh, initiative, and Russia has always been resistant to um, endowing this organization with more economic heft, even at its own expense. And so Russia has has been an obstacle to the organization's um, economic initiatives, especially uh, those where China might benefit uh, in, in the energy sphere, for example. Um, so, so we have seen some evidence of competition. Uh, Chinese experts claim that Russia tries to, um, to uh, denigrate its activities in the region, that the Russian media perpetuates the, the Sinophobia that you do see in this region. And, and I, when I was in Kazakhstan, I had the opportunity to, to observe some Russian experts um, making some veiled criticisms of China in their engagements with, with uh, local scholars. Uh, so I do think that there is some undercurrent there of, of competition. And we also see uh, some uh, efforts by Russia to maintain its privileged security role in terms of being reluctant to share information with China on certain security issues. Uh, for example, the January 2022 20, events in Kazakhstan. So, um, how would we know that the deepening China-Russia partnership that we observe globally is having an impact on Central Asia? Uh, so uh, a couple of indicators in my mind would be um, if we started to see more China-Russia joint economic initiatives in the region and especially within the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Um, we did see at the Xi Putin summit some discussion of more coordination between the two countries um, in Central Asia, which was interesting to me, and also a statement that China would engage more with the CSTO. So we'll see what, what that means. Uh, and that leads to my second indicator, which would be if Russia gives its blessing to gra a greater security role for China in the region. Um, because that would really indicate that they would be uh, partners in the region rather than competitors. And so I want to spend a little time now on a couple of assumptions about China-Russia relations uh, and Central Asia. One is that um, because of the war in Ukraine, Russia is weakening. And this automatically translates into greater Chinese influence in Central Asia. Um, so uh, I think that this is, this is a, a mistaken assumption. And um, I think we, we focus a lot on China's very important role in the economic sphere in Central Asia um, in terms of providing 
uh, loans to countries, providing investment, and a market for goods. So clearly there, China is important. But China has been relatively ineffective in the security sphere in the region. Um, in the January 2022 events in Kazakhstan, I was told by experts there that Chinese officials were really um, uh, sidelined. They really were not very aware of the of what was happening. They asked Russia for uh, information and didn't receive it. Um, in the conflict between Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, similarly, they did not play uh, much of a role. And I was told that this was partly because China, China, some Chinese diplomats are more focused on global politics than the domestic politics of the countries where, where they are based and don't really have a firm understanding of the local dynamics. Uh, for China, the, the emphasis, apart from the global uh, competition element, uh, restraining the influence of the US and other democratic countries, avoiding color revolutions, so, and so pro-democratic movements in these regions, the, the primary interest for China is really domestic. And that is the Uyghur issue in China, um, uh, and also preventing a uh, spillover of terrorist and separatist movements uh, from, from the region into China. Um, and when I was in Kazakhstan, a lot of talk was about a, a statement at the SCO summit that Xi Jinping made to President Tokayev of Kazakhstan about how China would be um, supportive of Kazakhstan's sovereignty. Kazakhstan also has a long border with Russia, and, and there's a lot of unease there in light of the Russian invasion of another uh, a former Soviet state. And so I would say that this, this statement is by Xi was overplayed because uh, this is a statement that China has typically made in Central Asia. Um, it's one of the principles of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization to respect the sovereignty of other countries. And I, I think it's a big ask uh, for China to be protecting the sovereignty of, of Central Asian states. Um, China actually had signed an agreement in 2013 with Ukraine where it uh, pledged and support for its sovereignty, and that did not turn into anything very concrete, as we have seen, with with Xi not even agreeing to a phone call, let alone a visit uh, with President Zelensky. When I was in Kazakhstan, the word I heard most associated with Russia was toxic, uh, that, that uh, Russia was a, a toxic partner, but uh, losing ground in many ways, but also a key partner because of linguistic ties, cultural ties, uh, migration flows. And in Kazakhstan and elsewhere in the region, there's a great effort to avoid alienating Russia. And uh, there's also a great deal of suspicion and xenophobia uh, regarding China. And so even though Central Asian countries are very connected economically uh, to China, they were very concerned about the the impacts of this economic relationship with China. And so I think even though Russia has weakened economically and is seen as toxic, that doesn't mean necessarily that China is going to swoop in and have more influence in the region uh, for, for a lot of uh, factors. And a second assumption that I think is false is that, that this is some kind of great game and that it's a, an arena for major powers um, and that Central Asian states themselves don't have agency. Uh, and I think that's, that's also uh, incorrect. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in, a, in a minute. Um, we have seen China try to uh, create some new dynamism in its approach to Central Asia with its C5 plus one initiative that came out in July of 2020. And this was building on its uh, Health Silk Road diplomacy 
initiatives in the region, and also following efforts by other countries, including the US, Japan, the EU, South Korea, to engage with Central Asia. And there will be the first uh, summit meeting in China of, of this new arrangement in May. Um, and it's interesting because it's a way that China can engage with Central Asia without Russia. So the SEO would involve Russia. Here we would have a mechanism to engage with them with, without Russia. And so it would be interesting to see uh, what that initiative uh, will, will bear, will bring out. Um, for Central Asia, though, I mean, there are considerable risks in, uh, in relying more on China. Uh, there's been some great reporting by a US NGO called Aid Data about the hidden debts that countries have uh, to China, and not just sovereign debt, but also uh, debt uh, from state-owned enterprises that governments uh, guarantee implicitly. Um, and for China, there are also risks in, in this economic engagement with, with Central Asia in terms of economic losses through non-payment of loans and also concerns about political and economic instability affecting investments and also potential Russian reactions to efforts by China to um, to play a greater role in the region. So I'm going to just uh, speak a little bit about Kazakhstan since I was just doing field work there and uh, what the impact of the China Russia partnership is on Kazakhstan in particular. So Kazakhstan has has the biggest economy in the region and has sought for many years to outline a, what they call a multi-vector foreign policy that would, it's caught between the two powers, Russia and China, um, but wants to engage with other countries. Um, but as the Sino-Russian partnership deepens, uh, this creates more pressure on Kazakhstan. It feels more, that has less space because the two countries around it are teaming up more closely. Um, but I would say that Kazakhstan um, doesn't approach China and Russia as a team. It approaches them as individual states uh, and acts differently and separately with each one. Um, and for Kazakhstan, Russia still, despite being toxic, is the priority partner, um, and China, a very significant economic partner, but one with some drawbacks too. Um, and so in, when I was in Almaty and Astana recently, uh, I heard about a, a couple of issues that were very much on the minds of, of experts as they looked at the relationship with China. One was the issue of the digital Silk Road. So China is trying to move beyond infrastructure um, and you know, roads and rail to, talk, to build you know, um, information uh, connections and, and strengthen that kind of tie between China and other countries. And for Kazakhstan, this is an opportunity to upgrade telecommunications technology, but also a risk in terms of providing China with access to data um, and coding from Kazakhstan. So they were taking steps to protect um, that by doing their own coding, by not allowing data to be uh, held in China and so on. And my project was was more focused on the environmental side. And so I was looking at what were the environmental risks of Chinese investments in Kazakhstan. And so uh, there was a lot of discussion about 52 projects that China had agreed to develop in um, in Kazakhstan. And uh, one problem with this was that there was very little information about it. Uh, the government of Kazakhstan didn't provide a lot of information about these 
these projects, and that led to a lot of suspicion by experts about what they involved exactly. And um, so it was really only the environmental activists who could point me in the direction of information of, of, and a real list of these projects. And so um, I found out that uh, less than half have been completed, uh, uh, 15 are in process and 17 were being reviewed. And so you have a mix of fossil fuel projects and some renewable projects. Um, and so uh, the, the, the problem here was that the lack of information was about the projects was fueling uh, hostility to them. And that's partly because of some other issues in the relationship um, in terms of uh, China's uh, water usage, um, China being upstream of Kazakhstan, and um, this affecting the availability of water in the country and the quality of the water, there are allegations of pollution uh, in the water, um, and other environmental complaints about some existing projects that China is investing in in the country. Um, and, and public opinion surveys in Kazakhstan show that there's a lot of skepticism that Chinese investments are going to be beneficial for the country and its people. And this is compounded by nationalism on the Chinese side, um, not necessarily state directed, but uh, because there's uh, inadequate information flows on both sides, uh, this led to some skepticism um, further skepticism in Kazakhstan about Chinese intentions. So there was an article in, in the nationalist media in China that alleged that some lands in Kazakhstan allegedly belonged to China. And this created a firestorm of criticism. And I got there and you know, two years later, and people were still talking about this article and supposed maps that China had that showed that they felt entitled to certain lands across the border. Uh, so I think a lack of information uh, sharing by the gov both governments, uh, nationalism on the Chinese side comp compounds some of the mutual suspicions. Um, so what are the options then for, uh, for Central Asia and Kazakhstan? Um, in the United States, there's a lot of wishful thinking about wedges and how we can separate China from Russia. Personally, I think this is not an effective strategy because Putin and uh, Xi are very interdependent in a way in terms of their shared concern about regime security. And uh, th there was a very interesting statement that that she uh, made to Putin as he was leaving Moscow. He talked about how um, there are changes, the likes of which we have not seen for 100 years. And we are the ones driving these changes together. So, so if you follow Chinese political statements, this is something that she has, has stated uh, repeatedly connected to his own plans for the so-called rejuvenation of the of China connected to his own regime, uh, and so to, to include Putin in this shows to me shows that he sees some um, interdependence between the two that they both are are um, autocrats with unlimited time frames in office and uh, are committed to uh, to staying that way, <laughs> and so I don't think that improving relations with one or the other is going to have an impact uh, on their partnership for this reason. Um, however, you, despite this shared concern for regime security, they have different interests in Central Asia. And Central Asian states act in their own separate ways in response to each one of them. Um, so, so the interesting uh, trend has been 
um, I think this series shows this the speaker speaker series shows uh, shows evidence of this that other states in the region are more interested in engaging with Central Asia. So we see a lot of interest in uh, in Central Asia and engaging with India and Turkey and other states. Um, the U.S. and the EU, uh, Japan, South Korea have made initiatives uh, periodically and visits to the region, but it has not, at least in the case of the U.S., it not, has not always been very consistent. Um, there was a, a phase of great interest right after the 9-11 um, uh, uh, events in the U.S. Uh, entry into Afghanistan, and then as we exited or began drawing down, there was less interest in Central Asia. Uh, so we need more consistent efforts, we need more uh, collaboration. And I think I'm going to close with one uh, issue, and that is about um, energy transition. I think that's a very interesting area where, uh, which would benefit Central Asia and reduce its dependence on both uh, Russian and uh, China, Russia and China, it, it, both countries are involved in the, the fossil fuel sectors in, uh, in these countries. And as they develop more um, uh, renewable options, they have more choice of partners uh, for these technologies and uh, less dependence on these pipeline structures that keep them bound uh, and stuck in their difficult neighborhood. Uh, so I'm gonna stop there. Um, I do write a, a blog called chinasresourcerisks.com that looks at some of the resource issues that I'm uh, addressing in my current book project. So thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh... Professor Vishnik, uh, for your very interesting and wide-ranging uh, address on the Sino-Russian partnership and the role of China and Russia in, in Central Asia. You have addressed a number of the relevant uh, areas, including the various drivers of their partnership, both the material or the resources aspects, as well as uh, the normative aspects. So I think, uh, first of all, I think uh, we may have some questions. We will take those questions. Uh, in the context of uh, the Ukraine-Russia war, if you can, and I mean, if you could just start from that normative aspect, what, how do you look at this uh, particular, you know, uh, the way this uh, Ukraine, uh, I mean, uh, Russia and China coming together uh, for the, on the question of uh, Ukraine, as well as on the questions of sovereignty, on the question of rules-based order, particularly if you see uh, there's a lot of discussion I was seeing on, on Twitter and on these platforms as well about BRICS coming up as a counterweight to G7, you know, their economic performance. So all of this, you know, how does the global south, you know, coming up as a counterweight to the west, how do you look at this, the normative aspects of this? Thank you. That's a that's an interesting question. I think there are two different aspects to it. I think one is how the two, how Russia and China themselves justify their um, cooperation or their joint response uh, on Ukraine, and then uh, the the question about the global south. So China is trying to thread the needle. It it has had a very strong position on sovereignty and territorial integrity uh, for its own interests uh, to justify its own claims um, to Taiwan uh, to areas of the South China Sea and so on. Um, and so, uh, and China also had, uh, prior to the Russian invasion, a very good relationship with Ukraine. They were investing in ports in Ukraine, in including Mariupol, which Russia then destroyed. Um, it had agriculture investments, energy investments, the Belt and Road went through Ukraine. Um, so. China lost uh, economically from this invasion. It had 6,000 citizens living in Ukraine at the time of the Russian invasion. And when Putin met Xi in, on February 4th, apparently he told him not to worry 
uh, because China did not evacuate those citizens until after the, the war began. Um, so I think that, that there is a little evidence in the summit of some distrust uh, between Xi, Xi and Putin on that uh, point, I would say, because Xi in his statement talked about the need to build mutual trust and Putin talked about how trust was already achieved. <laughs> so to me, that indicates that there's some discrepancy there. Um, I think China has, has moved over to the Russian position on European security, uh, also to its detriment, because China's relations with European countries have deteriorated in the past year over Ukraine, uh, because uh, people in Europe, uh, as in the US, see China as an implicit supporter of Russia on this issue. Uh, so we have seen uh, China agreeing with Russia on, on the threat that NATO poses, and it's a kind of vicious uh, cycle because as China and Russia seem to be drawing closer together, NATO becomes more concerned about uh, events in the Indo-Pacific and has been reaching out more to those countries and countries like uh, Japan and uh, um, South Korea and, uh, and India also have been um, more interested in cooperating with uh, US alliances than before. Uh, I would say India has its own reasons for, for being concerned about uh, China not, not connected to Ukraine, uh, but, but all of this is focusing um, the attention that China has on um, the areas of agreement it has with Russia on um, U.S. alliances and partnerships, um, in the in, and their statements also on you uh, that you would think would be more focused on Ukraine also talk a lot about Indo-Pacific security, U.S. Uh, partnerships there like the Quad and AUKUS and, and, and so on. The Global South is a more interesting question. I, I think that there is division in the Global South in terms of Ukraine. And if you look at the Indo-Pacific region, uh, you see some unease about it. Um, most countries have um, abstained on various issues in the UN, although they did uh, vote against um, Russia in the most recent vote about Ukraine. Um, and I think that there are some concerns in this part of the world about food prices, about availability of energy. And we saw the leader of Indonesia try to impress on the leaders of Russia and Ukraine the need to stop the war because it was harming the interests of people in, in the Indo-Pacific region. In other areas, you know, in, in some parts of Africa and Latin America, Russia has found more support for its position. So I don't know that the global South is kind of unified in its, its response. And, you know, BRICS, I don't know if, if BRICS is unified in its response either. I mean, the, I think India's position has been somewhat different than that of the other countries uh, in BRICS. And it'd be very interesting to me to see how India leads the SCO um, and the G20 and, and so on in, in the future, because India has been the more critical uh, partner of Russia, you know, during this conflict. Right, right, right. Absolutely, absolutely. I think I agree with you that uh, Indian position is much more nuanced uh, than the other uh, members. Uh, so I think it's 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 to be seen what kind of. Uh, Posturing or what kind of decisions are happening both in the crucial uh, G20 summit that will happen uh, that might see, I mean, President Putin, Xi Jinping all uh, coming to New Delhi because there's, according to some reports, there is this uh, possibility of uh, the world leaders all coming together. But let's see uh, what kind of uh, decision making happens at the summit. But I wanted to come to this question of uh, another interesting question, which was, uh, I mean, based on some literature that was available, uh, you know, that. You know, both uh, if you look at both uh, Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin, they have been living in, in you know, in during the Cold War. You know, when they were growing up, they, 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 it was a Cold War, and you know, both countries were ideologically much more aligned. I mean, there was a communist uh, Soviet Union and a communist China, and if you 
some people have talked about the 50s when you know the china russia sino russian split hadn't happened and you know they were much more closer i mean i, I saw an article where somebody talked about uh, you know mao zedong's visit to uh, china in uh, into russia in 1957 when he was talking about uh, you know uh, russia and china coming closer and you know uh, uh, fighting against the west in that cold war scenario so how do you think i mean when even even president biden said in you know after the outbreak of the war that you know uh, putin is trying to rebuild the soviet empire something like that and so that kind of that kind of you know 20th century baggage you know how does the, that their personal relationship and their nostalgia for that uh, cold war situation do you think that has something to do i mean because uh, some articles talk about you know, there's this discussion about whether it's uh, it's about uh, the rational decision making you know i mean is it just about economic uh, i mean if you look at just economic decision making or is it also about you know rebuilding something and their present and their personal equations you can talk a bit about that well i think we we uh, focus on their personal relationship and they certainly try to play it up they make dumplings together, they eat ice cream together, they call each other dear friend and, and so on. Uh, but these are two very astute political leaders and I, I think uh, they, they know each other well, they've met 40 times, uh, but leaders don't really have to be best friends uh, to, to get along. Uh, but what they do share, I think, is a sense that the collapse of the Soviet Union was, was a, a disaster in the 20th century. Uh, Putin certainly thinks that way, and he's trying to recreate it in, in a new form. And for Xi, uh, he he sees um, she has talked about this often. Actually, the 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 terrible uh, uh, consequences of the collapse of the Soviet Union, and he sees it as a personal warning uh, to make sure that there's enough control within China to prevent such an outcome from happening. Although China doesn't have a kind of China has more of an internal empire uh, than than the Soviet Union had, and so the, you know this this lesson for Xi is that you need to have more control over all of the institutions of government to uh, clamp down on dissent and so on. And so I, you know, in my first book uh, on on China Russia relations, I talked a lot about how parallel domestic trajectories were important in cementing uh, the relationship between China and or, or, or uh, ending the dispute between China and the Soviet Union and then paving the way for uh, the partnership we have now. And I think that's still true. And I, you know, I think there, there's a lot of focus on, you know, Russia being the potential junior partner while this was, uh, you know, China was a little brother in the 1950s, and so what will that mean? But I think the, what's more important is that they that they have a shared normative vision of the world order. They have a shared concern about their regime's security, and uh, that is connecting them. Because for Xi, it would be a disaster if if Putin uh, falls from power and is re replaced by a weak leadership that leads to instability or some more pro-democratic leadership that, you know, however unlikely. Um, so that would be that would be a problem for Xi because it might give his opponents in China some reason to think, oh, if Putin can be toppled, then so can Xi. And also it could lead to instability again along the border. So I, I think the domestic uh, context is very important to keep in mind. Right, right, right. Talking about this, uh, I mean, I also take your point about, uh, you know, both uh, the, the, the regime survival question as well, as well as their shared vision about the world order. I want to talk about since now that Russia and China, I mean, coming together, this 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 kind of, uh, this close coming together, this kind of uh, meetings and summits that are showing this, how do you think the West uh, should uh, go for their balancing? Do you think they're doing, do you think they need to bolster this as a result of this uh, partnership? Well, I think that there are some concerns about what this means going forward. Um, like for military planners, it's a question if China and Russia will cooperate in their nuclear strategy. And, and that would mean that uh, the US would need to counter not just the Russian nuclear arsenal or the Chinese one, but both together. Uh, and so that that is a, 
a question for, for military planners. And also, you know, the demise of the arm con arms control regime puts us in a very dangerous position where we don't really have many restraints and our communication with both countries is poor. So that, that's a recipe for a lot of um, misunderstandings and inadvertent conflict. Uh, so I think um, engaging in communication despite the tensions we have is important to, of, you know, especially in the security sphere is very Im important. Um, I, you know, I'm not a believer in wedge uh, strategies. I don't think that they work because of the domestic component of this partnership. Um, but it's not just for, you know, the US and its allies to do things differently. It's also China and Russia to do things differently. <laughs> I mean, to, to um, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult when you have um, uh, pressures by China on neighboring countries like India, uh, on the border regions or on Taiwan or Japan. Um, it's, you know, Russia's still you know, fighting with everything it has in Europe. Um, so I think it's going to be very difficult to, to see a, um, any opportunity for a real change in, in the relations. But, but I think um, with respect to China, the, the US has to find some areas where we can engage with China. Um, you know, it's, it's very distressing that even in a pandemic, we were unable to, to find ways to, to find common ground to deal with a, a, a global problem. Um, I mean, the environment has always been an issue that's been raised as one where we have common interests. But, but even there, now we're competing in these renewable technologies, and it's, it's just very difficult. Um, but I, I, I'm, as a Fulbright uh, alumna, I'm a believer in people-to-people -people exchanges. I think we need to keep our educational exchanges going. I think we need to have some channels of dialogue and uh, you know, try to prevent conflicts from, from getting out of control. Right. So I just want to come to your, uh, you know, your statement that, you know, about the junior partner thing. So, I mean, we focus a lot on the convergence on the things where both Russia and China agree on, but there are many things that they don't agree on. For example, if you look at just India, I mean, India with Russia and China, the policy uh, or the, the trajectory uh, of the relationship has been very di different. How do you think if the, is, there's this concern about Ch Russia becoming a junior partner, what do you think will happen to these divergences between the two countries? I mean, whose will will have a, a greater say? Yeah, I can imagine that for, for India, this is a hot topic. Uh, so if, if Russia becomes more dependent on China, would uh, Russia be forced to downgrade its military ties to India, for example? Um, but first, I think we need to keep this junior partner uh, issue in context. So it's true that Russia is more dependent economically on China now um, for its trade, it receives some semiconductors from China and, and so on, and they uh, use some uh, yuan uh, for you know for uh, trade instead of uh, euros or, or dollars. Um, so that's one thing. But China is also dependent on Russia, and we have to be cognizant of that. I mean, they do get a substantial amount of their energy from Russia. And I think they're wary of becoming more dependent. And so one thing we did not see at the summit was a power of Siberia two gas pipeline agreed. And this was, you know, Putin was talking about it as if it was a done deal. This would be a gas pipeline from Russia going through Mongolia to China. And uh, China has always been wary of transit country uh, pipelines because they think the Chinese think that they're less safe. And um, China's also been negotiating with Turkmenistan about a fourth pipeline, gas pipeline. And this tells me that maybe China doesn't want to have uh, so much energy coming from Russia um, in this situation where it's not clear what's going to happen with Russia in the long term. And um, China gets some agricultural products from Russia. It gets some timber products uh, from Russia. And the timber products are a reflection of the uh, lack of water that China has in its northern areas and 
uh, trees requiring a lot of water. So, so in effect, China relies on Russia for some part of its water. And so, so I think that there are some some aspects uh, that we you know of the resource piece that we need to keep in mind. And also, China doesn't have many alternatives for partners. So Russia has India, Russia has Vietnam, uh, but China just really has Russia as, as far as a a, a great power. Um, well, Vietnam is a smaller country, but but Russia has at least the longstanding 75 year partnership with India. For China, if Russia was not its partner, who would be its partners? So it has tr more troublesome partners like Pakistan, it has smaller countries like Laos and Cambodia. Um, so China would be in a difficult position globally without Russia. Uh, so, you know, it's not all about the, the economic weight. Uh, I think Russia has value for China as a partner and Chinese officials have have stated that, that Russia is an asset, not, not a liability. And, and I think we should take them at their word for that. Thank you so much. I think if you talk a bit about the European Union, uh, many members of the European countries so far are a bit uh, skeptical to directly criticize China. I mean, they still want to explore their relationship with uh, China. So where do you think now that uh, Russia and China are coming closer? Where does it put Europe? Well, we've seen uh, Europe uh, become more skeptical of China. The investment agreement that was supposed to be signed uh, uh, was not signed with China. Uh, we've seen uh, European countries uh, express greater support for Taiwan, uh, leave the uh, seven, what was once the 17 plus one format, which was a grouping of EU and non-EU countries plus China is now like 14 or 15 plus one. Um, as the Baltic states have left and, and some others are considering it. So I, I think uh, China made a mistake in its February 4th agreement in signing on to the Russian view of European security. Uh, because, because Europeans found that statement very shocking that China was saying that it didn't support the post-war configuration of a European territory. Um, and so that raised a lot of alarm bells in Europe, and it's and it's this is going to be a problem um, in China's relations with European countries going forward, and in its aspirations to play a greater role in the European Arctic too. I would say. Right, right, absolutely. I want to come to the question. You said something that you know. It would be wrong to say that Central Asian states don't have agency. Of course, they have agency, but in in that now they are, uh, you know, stuck between uh, the People's Republic of China and with Russia and with very asymmetrical relationship with these two giant powers. So, how do you think they maintain uh, their agency uh, if these two countries uh, start playing together, like Russia and China come together? And of course, if you, as you were saying, that you know, if the Russia delegates some of its security roles uh, to China. How do you think that would play out? Well, I don't think Russia is delegating any security roles to China. I think, I think if they do that, that would that would be very significant. I guess I'm skeptical that Russia and China are truly going to collaborate in Central Asia, and and I see Central Asian countries uh, very adept at understanding the different roles that the two powers play in their region and looking for others to come in. And, and I think that um, there, there is that opportunity because now there's a lot of interest in Central Asia again. You know, this, this uh, lecture series is a testament to it. Uh, we haven't seen so much interest in Central Asia in some time. And um, there's a lot of, I mean, it's true that the two powers are becoming closer, but other states are playing interesting roles like Turkey, uh, um, Iran, uh, India. Um, I mean, a lot of countries are looking again at Central Asia and partly the uh, transport networks in Ukraine um, being disrupted led to some rethinking about how do we get our energy out? Uh, how do you know, how do we who are we going to trade with? How do we avoid sanctions? And then also COVID. I think COVID was a, a wake-up call 
like for Kazakhstan, because they lost a huge market when the border was closed. And so there was a realization that there's too much dependence on the Chinese market and there needs something else needs to be done about it. Um, so it's going to take time. Uh, and these countries are um, in, in a kind of a, a, a new state of awareness since the invasion of Ukraine, where they're trying identity issues are becoming more salient. A younger generation is less tolerant of the old ways of doing things. And I think that generation is going to really um, provide greater agency for the countries. Right, right. Do you think other regional uh, issues like, you know, we had the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan and also the Uyghur issue, Uyghur Muslims issue, uh, you know, in, in the Xinjiang province, these uh, playing a role in the Central Asian geopolitics? I think so. And, you know, I was very surprised in uh, Kazakhstan how aware um, people were of the uh, repression going on in Xinjiang. And people were very, had a lot of information. They were very upset about it. Um, they, you know, because Kazakhs uh, like, and other Central Asians were caught up in these so-called re-education camps too. So I think that certainly, uh, you know, colors perspectives of, on China among the population. I mean, the governments have to have a, a, a good relationship with China, but, but I think there are limits to it because of the popular um, unease with, with some aspects of it. In terms of Afghanistan, that's certainly a, a big concern, especially for Tajikistan and uh, Uzbekistan. Um, and that's an area where I think the international community, you know, has to figure out a way of, of being more supportive in some way. I mean, it's very difficult with the Taliban regime in power. Um, countries don't want to recognize that regime, um, but there are some uh, you know, there's fallout from that, from the security situation that requires an intervention that countries need to address. I see. I, see. I think uh, that's that's. I mean, that's a very relevant uh, aspect to discuss in detail. I mean, uh, because these kind of various factors affect the geopolitical uh, scenario as well as you were talking about. You know, the public perception of these countries out of the a look at these countries. Uh, do you think that uh, China and Russia coming together or these kind of alliances, will it increase uh, the trustworthiness or the value of the West in Central Asia? Uh, and by West, I also include countries like, say, Japan or South Korea. I mean, if you think of these countries, they have a lot of uh, developmental uh, initiatives and investments in Central Asia. I think so. I think as long as they're consistent about it and um, are looking at what uh, you know, looking not to duplicate efforts, but to, you know, work with other countries in the region. I mean, Mongolia has an interesting uh, response with Mongolia, like Kazakhstan is stuck between uh, Russia and China, and they have what they call a third neighbor policy, where they engage with democratic states, um, including India, um, also uh, US and Japan, South Korea. And I and that's of great value for Mongolia and in, in its situation. Um, I think for Central Asian countries, it's more complicated because there are autocracies. Uh, they are bound in some uh, Russia-led institutions like the CSTO and then the China-led SCO. So there's perhaps less space, um, but uh, they um, are integrated in certain global energy markets. And we see Kazakhstan now exporting um, oil to Germany and uh, has an energy relationship with Italy. So, so I think that, that there is some, some uh, um, economic uh, engagements, corporate engagements um, that also provide opportunities for the region. Right, right, right. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we have a question. Oh, we have Ambassador uh, Rajiv Bhatia, who is a former Indian ambassador. He has a question. Go ahead, please. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Elizabeth. 
my warmest congratulations to you on a most comprehensive, uh, candid, and yet very nuanced uh, presentation uh, on the China-Russia relationship it's with a special reference to Central Asia. Uh, it's very rare for us here in India to, such, to hear such illuminating and objective comments on such a vexed uh, issue. My question, uh, Madam, is uh, about the implications of uh, this new phase in the Russia-China relationship on the prospects of success of the G20 summit and SCO summit to be hosted by India. You came quite close to answering it, then uh, you went away on to other uh, domains. My specific question is uh, that despite the two countries coming closer together, there are obviously divergences and there are conflict of interests which are reflected in other regions as well. So on G20 and on SCO summits, what can India expect from these two major powers when they uh, get represented here in Delhi? Good luck to India. <laughs> it's going to be a, a, a challenge, I, th I think, in, in these uh, venues, especially the SCO. I think in the SCO, India is somewhat the outlier as a democracy in this uh, a group of autocrats. Um, uh, I'm, you know, I, I guess my, I would have a question to you of what India might hope to achieve there in this, in this year, because I, I think what we saw at the G20 already was that uh, China and Russia were, re, were resistant to signing a joint statement uh, because of its characterization of the of the war in Ukraine. Um, I think in the G20, India has more space um, because of the broader participation to highlight uh, other priorities. In the SEO, there's, and I think you have more the domestic agendas of states appearing. And, you know, it's going to be diff more difficult beyond very narrow um, kinds of connectivity ideas uh, to really, or perhaps counterterrorism uh, concerns regarding Afghanistan. Um, to 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 have a successful uh, engagement. So, um, um, Mr. Ambassador, I'd be interested in your thoughts. Uh, where you think India can play a role in these bodies? Very uh, gracious of you. If the chair allows me, yeah, I yeah, sure. We'll just make very brief comments and uh, do a follow up question to you, Madam. On the um, SEO, you are absolutely right. India has uh, been. Uh, uh, a kind of a secondary player. Uh, we feel happy that we are inside the tent and so we know firsthand as to what is going on there. And we have uh, obviously soft power and a little bit of economic uh, interaction to push. And of course, there is the political and diplomatic uh, dimension as well. So it is heartening to note that uh, between Russia and China, there are significant differences even on countries, such major countries as Kazakhstan. So I think our policy makers will naturally take note of it. On G20, uh, what has happened so far at the level of finance ministers meetings and the foreign ministers meetings, I think that was fairly expected because the, the Bali uh, formulation has been misused by the West to project that India is only criticizing Russia as if the famous phrase, uh, this is not the era of war is directed only at Putin and not at the West as well. But uh, I, one feels that uh, when the G20 summit takes place, perhaps uh, President Mayor, who may be inclined to be uh, a little fair to India to make sure that G20 succeeds, uh, whether he would actually do so, uh, whether China will allow him to do so, are the questions uh, that need reflection. And I think from your vantage position in the US and with very impressive academic credentials, maybe you could uh, once again uh, briefly uh, speculate, if not reflect, as to the chances of G20 success uh, in Delhi. Well, I, I think China is not in a position to tell Putin what to do at the G20 summit or uh, because we've, we've seen, we have not yet seen um, Putin cow to Chinese interests. Uh, for example, in the Arctic, uh, we've seen uh, speculation that China is going to come in and, and uh, uh, 
take up a lot of the available investments and dominate uh, the Russian Arctic. But Russia has been engaging with other countries, including India, uh, UAE, Turkey in the Arctic. So I think Russia is still trying to balance its foreign policy at this stage. Um, I don't know that uh, Putin would be trying to help India. I think Putin's trying to help himself and, and uh, try to uh, stir up uh, disagreement among the the participants uh, that would benefit his cause in, in Ukraine. Uh, so I'm not sure. Um, I know I wish India success, uh, but it's a difficult international climate uh, that we're faced in today. Right, right. Thank, Thank you, you very, so much. very much. Really appreciate your uh, insight. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ambassador Bhatia, for your question. Thank you so much. So, uh, I mean, I would like to come to this. Uh, this you, you, you also mentioned about no limits partnership. And also you talk about that. Uh, you seem to suggest that it's not that Russia just needs China. China also needs uh, Russia. So in this context, how do you think uh, this partnership goes forward in, in, in a global context, particularly that, you know, uh, that China is, you know, rising and that China would uh, like to, you know, there might be, you know, China's competition with the United States. So how does this, uh, this dependence on Russian Federation uh, factor into that competition? Well, I think um, it factors in that uh, China can can avoid a two front conflict. Uh, that was always its concern. Um, you know, at the time when it had uh, was is in a conflict with the Soviet Union and the United States during the Cold War period. So now at least they can be sure that their border um, is safe and they don't have to uh, be preparing for conflict with Russia at the same time as they're preparing for one with the US. Uh, but what China does not know is how much they can rely on Russia in any conflict situation. And, you know, partly this is connected to how much support is China providing to Russia right now, uh, which is uh, not as much probably as Putin would like. He would probably like some additional military equipment, for example, uh, but China is not providing that. Uh, as so would it be reasonable for China to expect Russia to then uh, support uh, China militarily in a conflict? And I also wonder if China rises and becomes stronger, whether Russia would be interested in supporting, let's say China uh, takes Taiwan and, and satisfies that longstanding goal. Uh, Russia might be concerned that perhaps China might turn its attention to formerly disputed border areas with Russia. If China is no longer concerned about Taiwan, maybe other territories might be of interest to China. Uh, so, so there's a, I think uh, there's a, a, a danger if China becomes too strong that uh, the partnership with Russia might become um, um, might be affected, you know, detrimentally. Right, right, right. Thank you so much uh, for the discussion. I think we uh, covered a number of uh, interesting aspects uh, from the context of uh, the Sino-Russian partnership, as well as uh, their roles in Central Asia, the Central Asian geopolitics, and with the uh, recent incidents, as well as uh, the some projections, some predictions, and some probabilities uh, for the future. I thank you. Uh, Professor Wishnik for delivering this uh, talk. I now request uh, Dr. Kamakshi Vasan, Chief Operating Officer and Director of Academic Programs at the Chinookno Foundation, kindly deliver the closing remarks and the vote of thanks. Hello, everyone. It is my pleasure to deliver the closing remarks and the vote of thanks at the special lecture session on Sino-Russian partnership and the roles of China and Russia in Central Asia organized by the Lotama Foundation. We had an excellent and a highly erudite session today on an extremely relevant and important theme. My congratulations to the distinguished speaker, Professor Elizabeth Vishnik, and session chair, Mr. Soham Das, chairperson and director of the Lotama Foundation. Professor Vishnik has provided us with a comprehensive overview 
of the evolving dynamics between China, Russia, and Central Asia, and how the relationships have shaped the region's political and economic landscape. Her expertise in the field is truly remarkable, and we are grateful for the opportunity to have heard her speak. The Sino-Russian partnership has been evolving in recent years, with the two countries finding common ground on issues, such as opposition to US global dominance and support for multilateralism. In Central Asia, China and Russia have traditionally played different roles, with Russia having a strong military and economic presence in the region. However, China's Belt and Road Initiative has allowed it to expand its economic influence in the region, potentially challenging Russia's dominance. The two countries' partnership in the region could have significant implications for the region's security and stability, as well as the wider global geopolitical landscape. The Exploring Central Asia talk series being hosted by the Tilotama Foundation in February and March 2023 saw some of the leading experts on Central Asia from across the world talk about diverse dimensions about this fascinating region. Today, we had an excellent final talk of the season of the series. We will have another season of this talk series soon. I would like to express my gratitude to all of you for joining us today for our discussion on the Sino-Russian partnership and the role of Russia and China in Central Asia has been both informative and engaging. Thank you, Professor Vishnik, for your great presentation. I would like to deeply thank our students, researchers, and attendees who have shown a keen in interest in exploring this fascinating region. I hope that this series has provided you with a deeper understanding of Central Asia's history, culture, and politics. We at the Tilotama Foundation work with an unwavering commitment to promoting cultural and intellectual exchanges with an unbiased and inclusive approach. The foundation has a deep focus on our global standard work on Central Asia and Eurasia. We look forward to welcoming you all again for our future initiatives and events. Thank you.